And looks like we're live. Good afternoon and welcome to WFDD's very first virtual community conversation, Race and the White Ally Toolkit. I'm Molly Davis, Assistant General Manager at WFDD. There are a lot of reasons people value and rely on public radio. It creates an environment for lifelong learning. It presents opportunities to hear perspectives and viewpoints different from our own, allowing us to challenge our own beliefs and opinions. And it provides a space for civil discourse. We hope to honor all of those tenets in this community conversation and we are so glad you're here to be a part of it. A quick reminder that our second virtual community conversation is coming up next week with WFDD's Carrie Brown. She'll speak with local education experts about what back to school means now. So mark your calendars for August 6th and plan to join us. Now, if you're viewing this on YouTube, you can participate in the conversation using the live chat feature. If you're watching on our Facebook page, you can add your comments and questions to the post. Now, I'd like to welcome our featured guest today, Dr. David Kant. In addition to his many other accolades, he just made his second appearance on The Daily Show this past Monday night. He's an author, speaker, dialogue facilitator, and the creator of the White Ally Toolkit. And he's here with us today for a conversation with WFDD's very own David Ford and with you. David? Thanks, Molly. And uh, thank you, David, for being here. Uh, David, I, we've spoken a, a couple of times at the studio and I've seen your work on video, uh, working with large crowds and individuals talking about race. You make it look easy, uh, but it's not. Uh, and talking about issues of race, especially with folks whose views are diametrically opposed to your own, can be really tough for, for most of us. Let me begin by asking you, why has it traditionally been so difficult to to talk about these issues. Um, it's so great to be here. I really appreciate uh, being a part of this. I think it's so difficult. One reason is because we all have a sense, no matter where we are on the in the in racial groups or on the political spectrum, that a big problem has been committed in our society. That we've we have this big wound and this big difficult history. And part of the reason why it's difficult is because we all want to be disconnected from that. We all, we all feel uncomfortable that that's been a part of the American story. And so there's very many things to do with that. One thing to do with that is, well, that was a long time ago. One thing to do with it is, well, um, that wasn't me. That was somebody else. And even if it, was a long time ago and it was related to me, there's no moral obligation. That's another place another place to put that. We all wanna be innocent of that. I, uh, I remember an article by a guy named Shelby Steele, a conservative black author who I disagree with mostly, but he wrote an article, I think in 88, about uh, the, the quest for innocence. It's like, we all wanna be innocent of the problem. And so we have various things we do with that. We deny that racism is real. We deny racism in the past matters and we deny that there's any connection to it to us now or any moral obligation. And I think that the struggle around that is part of the reason why, uh, why it's hard to talk about. And it, it, it has always been hard to talk about. So yeah. like, I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, I, in preparation for this session, I did a little bit of looking back at um, public opinion history in the past. And there's, there's public opinions that seem crazy. So, you know, it's, it's like in the 50s, like 89% of America, especially white America, was against interracial marriage, right? So that's, we can look at that as bad, but we have other things that are equally, might seem equally strange to us. Like in 1962, 85% of white folks said that uh, black children have access to an equal education as white children in 1962, right? Um, in 1964, 74% uh, of white folks said that the, the, the freedom struggle was hurting black people, right? Um, so you have, there's always been a way in which we want to distance ourselves from the problem. Um, even by 1969, I think half of white folks were saying that black people had a better chance at jobs, right? So there's a way in which the, we all know this racial wound happened, this horrible thing happened for hundreds of years. And we want to say, 
we're past that, I'm not related to that. And so talking about that and the ugliness of that, and then it's a potential effect both on society and on us now is hard. So we don't want to do it, which is why even now 55% of white folks think that racism against people of color is just as important as against, uh, is just as significant as racism against, uh, um, sorry, racism against white people is just as significant as racism against people of color. At least that was before George Floyd. So uh, this denial is part of our history and part of what we have to figure out how to talk about. And that last statistic is fairly recent. I read that, it's, uh, it's really interesting. Uh, we're in this moment in history, it, uh, things, those sorts of conversations seem to be occurring with more frequency. What, give me your assessment, what seems to have changed today, this moment that has led so many new people to joining the conversation about racial equality, uh, many of them, you know, for the first time? Well, I think that several things have happened. You've had 30, 40 years of uh, racial education about racism, uh, starting perhaps with critical race theory and then ramifying out in the sort of in, in the ranks of college and the general culture where people have begun to examine how has our racial history affected our current situation. You have, so you have 30 years of that being in, in uh, certainly in college texts, if you want to, you know, uh, it's in those, in those college courses if you want to get that and often in just regular courses. So you have, so that, that has some impact and that affects the general culture. And then, of course, you had the uh, COVID situation, which puts us all in the house with not enough to do. Um, and then you have you've had movements over the period of years. You had you know Michael Ferguson has spawned Black Lives Matter, and then so you have this the most egregious murder that we've seen of all of these murders. We could go down the list. So, you know, we could look Eric Garner and Walter Scott and all those. We've never seen a murder like this that seems so brazen and we're looking in the face of both the victim and the perpetrator. This, this, this is Ava DuVernay's point that, that that was made this different. So in light of all of that, people said, you know, we've got to do something different. And then also we're, we're getting a daily dose of information about the fact that COVID affects people of color more. So I think all of that came together to say um, we have to do something. And of course, and let's be, let's be clear, a lot of what's going on out in the street in terms of racial protests, not all of it, there's, 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 there's Republicans out there. A lot of that is anti-Trump. So you also have, you also have people wanting an outlet to do something that uh, is against what they think is a, a, a problematic administration, racially problematic specifically. So all that combines to say, we, we have to do something different. And that's mm -hmm. what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, it's beautiful. And it creates challenges for the movement. And it creates challenges for those, uh, well, for, for people who've been in the movement and for those who are entering for the first time. And you, you pointed out, you've spoken to the need for humility on both sides of that equation, on the part of the, the enthusiastic newcomer to this, this debate, and then on the part of the seasoned activists out there. Why, why is that important, this, this notion of humility entering the debate? I have said uh, back at workshops, back when we used to have live workshops, David, <laughs> I miss you. I miss those days. <laughs> Come back. back. Back when we had those, I used to um, uh, point out that too many people in the uh, racial equity movement who are long timers, like their attitude when new people come in is, it's about time where you've been. And that, and that attitude is not the way you grow a movement. So okay. the, point, the point of that is that if you're trying to grow a, a social change movement, it is vital that you extend reasonable hospitality to people who are new to it. You want new people to be new to it. Like that's important to do. So um, I do have some concerns about uh, a level of snark that happens within some people who are long timers in this movement, uh, both of color and white, who, who, who have that kind of snarky attitude um, to newcomers, so I, so that so that, that grace is needed. Now at the same time, um, if you're if you come to a a, a a conversation, you're at work, you come to a conversation, and it's clear that the people have been talking about something you haven't been talking about it. You don't just like step in and decide you know what they're talking about. You 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 give some uh, some room for the possibility that there are things you don't know. 
So it is also important that people coming new to this movement um, take a breath, like join enthusiastically, recognize their own, what, what they don't know, that, that, that there's things that they don't know that they don't know, right? So they should, you want people to join enthusiastically, but to recognize there's some things that they need to learn. So I think, but so both of those are necessary for the movement to grow. Um, and, you know, and um, it is also important that, that people, part of that is a certain amount of grace that we need on this, on racial issues in, in general. Like don't, don't be, uh, Malcolm X had a quote, I can't get the quote exactly, but it basically is don't, um, don't look down on people who don't know what you know, because at one time you didn't know that yourself, right? So, so that's, so I, I don't have an exact quote, but um, it's at the front of one of my books. But uh, that's important to do. So I think that that grace both ways is vital to keep the movement growing. Mm. Well, that's good advice. And then uh, we're going to get to, you know, how to initiate these discussions, the do's. Let's talk in terms of the don'ts and do's. And 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 some of the uh, actually, you were quoted recently in a Medium article that that's uh, saying, from what I see on social media, a lot of white progressives, folks who are doing a great job marching with my brothers and sisters of color, are having some really bad conversations with their more conservative white friends and family. So in terms of the, the do's and don'ts in talking about race, what are some of, let's get to some of those don'ts that people should be aware of that you feel like, you, you've seen patterns, they, they happen frequently. Oh my gosh, yeah. Oh, and people tell me about uh, essentially how mean they are <laughs> to people in their family. I'm like, stop being so mean to your cousin. Like that's that's not that's not helping, right? Why so, so angry? Yeah. So um, so one of the things that's important to do is to make a distinction between anger at the problem of racism and anger at people who reflect the problem of racism. That that distinction is important. So I want people uh, protesting, marching, nonviolently, nonviolently. Being angry, right? Being angry about the problem, no problem. That, that, that's energizing, it mobilizes you, mobilizes other people. But don't be angry at your cousin because when you're talking to your cousin and you're trying to pull your cousin in to understanding that racism is a real thing we need to think about, your anger is not only non-productive, it's actually counterproductive. So, so, so one of the things is don't get angry. Now a version of that, a, a lofty word for that is show compassion. Show compassion for people that you're trying to uh, invite to a new understanding. So that's 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 a critical thing. The second thing is humility. Part of what people do is they they is they trying to persuade people about uh, racial issues. Their stance is like, you know, racism is a problem out there. It's a problem within you. I'm good though, right? And um and <laughs> that's not very inviting. And so what uh, the people need to come from a different place and to come from a place of, you know, I notice sometimes that I have racist thoughts and it looks like there's racism in society. I'm not the only person. Do you ever have those? Like that's a much more inviting uh, way of approaching it. I'd say that our model for this project is confession, concession, and compassion, right? Because, and, and I'll tell you about the concession part too. Part of what you wanna do when you're trying to have a conversation with somebody is, um, is to follow the ABC rule, agreement before challenges. So you want to find ways, if you're talking to somebody, find ways to agree with them before you try to challenge. So that means making strategic concessions in a conversation. So you're not trying to go at them with like, you're just wrong. You know, um, as I have said, People do not like to be corrected, but they don't mind learning. So your strategy, the mistake that people make is to be all about the correction energy as opposed to the invitation energy. And so to do that requires uh, being calm uh, and requires strategically looking at the conversation and not be all about like, I'm gonna make you different now, but it's, a, it's you're, you're inviting the person as opposed to um, just correcting them. Mm. Oh, don't get, don't get so, don't get, stop getting so mad. <laughs> like, <laughs> calm down, calm down. Stop getting so mad. Be re recognize that even if you're further down the road of racial understanding than they are, you ain't been woke yourself forever, right? So you, you could be, you could be them too. So 
have some compassion and then try to find in the course of the conversation before you try to move them forward, try to find some way you connect or agree with them. And people often don't want to do that. They, they're so agitated and they're so about change enough that they, they don't even want to look for how can I connect with this person? So those are some of the common pitfalls. One of the things you, you mentioned to me in the past that I thought was really powerful was this notion of just not dismissing somebody's concerns out of hand, or, you know, that, go, go there with me. Because I think that, that seems like that builds a bridge more than just about anything in that situation. Yeah, part of what, part of what happens is um, that people take the stance of everything the person says in their, in their battery of beliefs that are include, include uh, their, which you, which we decide is their racially problematic views that everything is wrong. And I'm going to teach them, I'm going to teach them that everything they think of is, is wrong. So, uh, and you, and, and that is the precise opposite thing you need to do if you're trying to persuade them. So, um, so for just as a, as a, as an easy example, um, although it has its own complexity, like take affirmative action, right? Now, you know, I think affirmative action is, is a good thing based on like, if you look at the racial inequities all across the board, right? From education to income to housing, you look at all of these inequities uh, and you look at even aggressive affirmative action programs don't, don't include that many people like that. that so, so let's face that. So I think that they're good things. Now, could it be possible that one could overdo that is it possible that one could overdo that? It's certainly possible to do that. But if you're arguing with somebody who, who thinks affirmative action is wrong and they talk about like the way that it could happen that unqualified people get jobs over people who are qualified, mm -hmm. you're better off acknowledging that that's at least a reasonable concern in theory as opposed to focusing on how that could never happen, basically. That's wrong, right? Even if in the real world, it doesn't happen. So I'm just saying that that, that, that be, being dismissive of somebody, it not only is, um, is a problem, like it is a problem rhetorically from an argument standpoint, but it also, when people uh, feel dismissed, they don't, they don't want to concede to you. They don't want to see your point, right? So, yeah. and part of, part of what we know is that the best way to get somebody to listen to you, is to listen to them first. So, I mean, there's good research on that. Um, and so if we want to be persuasive, you want to ask questions and listen to somebody's concerns and not dismiss them. Okay. Well, let's, uh, that leads us, uh, bridges very nicely into the do's, uh, uh, what to do. And uh, you've written several books on this, obviously, David. So when it comes to conversations on race, that's a big bulk of, of the output. How about the do's? How do we talk about these issues effectively? Uh, and uh, let's, let's go there. Sure. So uh, in my project, um, I teach something uh, called the race method of managing a conversation. And uh, it's the, the, the race stands for uh, reflect, ask, connect, expand. And it stands for the phases of a conversation. Sometimes they happen right in order. Sometimes you have to loop back. But if you do it in order, it goes like this. The, uh, our race is for reflect. And that basically means find a way to calm down like find a way to relax yourself in uh, when you know you're in this conversation, you know your emotions are about to about to get up, about to rage up because it's, it has emotional sales for you. You hopefully have done some work in advance to calm, to figure out what well, I need to calm down. Mm -hmm. And then you actually do it in the moment. So some people, some people uh, imagine their happiest place. Some people, uh, I've got a lot of good feedback on this one. Some people put the tongue on the roof of their mouth. Why? Because you can't talk with their hung like <laughs> your mouth, right? So people do that. But whatever, you need to find whatever it is for you so you can calm down. So that's step one. Step two, after you calm down, you want to ask questions. You want to um, get, uh, as, as somebody said, get curious, not furious. What you want to do mm -hmm. is to ask questions that are focused on probing the beliefs, but in particular, you want to try to get beneath the belief to the experience related to the belief, because you're going to have a more connecting conversation if you have a experience-based conversation, not a belief-based conversation. Okay, so reflect, ask, and ask questions to get to an experience related to their belief that you disagree with. Then connect, 
um, this is the concession part. This is where you try to find something that you can agree with in what they said. Even if you can't agree with the part that is the that you look as, as the racist part, you can find something else that you do agree with that's related to the topic. So you're trying to show them, I don't think you're completely crazy. So reflect, ask, connect, and then expand. Here is where you offer a story. Oh, by the way, I should say the connect, you should do it through a story. Like once you figure out what the thing is you want to connect on, you tell a story about it. So they've told you a story, and then you tell them a story. And telling stories taps into a part of our brain that we feel uh, more connected to other people. There's, there's something called mirror neurons that help us uh, when we're, you know, the, the reason why we cry at movies or get mad at, at uh, uh, when other people tell us a story about what something happened to them is because there's a part of our brain that links up with people um, and tries to mimic what we think their brain is doing. So, you, and that best happens to a story. So you connect to a story and then you try to expand through a story. You try to make your point, you think racism is real by telling a story about it. And the best type of story is the most powerful type of evidence is shown is one that shows that you have racially problematic thoughts and then you can connect that to racism in society. But the most, the most powerful type of story is one in which you show that you had problems, you had racial problematic thoughts. If you're trying to convince somebody that racism is real. Since we spoke first, I guess a couple of years ago, I've actually uh, tried out the race method on, on friends and acquaintances and- uh, How'd it work, brother? It, it, you know, it, the, the most important nugget there was don't expect to change the world in one conversation, which you share with me as well. And one little step forward is a step forward. So I, I had a couple of steps forward and uh, appreciate that. I was curious to get your take on, I'm having, taught this method, the race method, to thousands of folks. What do you find in those workshops online and in person is the most challenging of those four steps? We're going we're gonna to enact out a, a, a little dialogue in just a minute to, to give listeners a sense of how this works in real time. But before we do, I wanted you to speak to what are the, what are the challenging ones of that, that process that you've seen over the years? Right. I think that the biggest difficulty is, again, just to be clear, the White Ally Toolkit, whiteallytoolkit.com, the biggest, uh, the, the, the biggest challenge for white folks uh, who want to make a difference on racism by being more persuasive, which is what we focus on, the biggest is deciding that those little moments of uh, where you had racially problematic thoughts are something that I can look at and then share with other people. So that, that, that confession part, that's why it's confession, concession, compassion, that's why confession is first. And, and I'm not the only person saying that. Like Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, the guy that wrote Stamp from the beginning, How to Be Anti-Racist, he says, uh, the heart of racism is denial and the heart of anti-racism is confession, right? So I'm not the only one saying this. So the, the biggest challenge, I mean, the, all the steps are challenging for different reasons, but the biggest one is saying, you know, um, I noticed the last week when I was, uh, when some black guy passed me in the parking lot, walked by in the parking lot, I locked my door or, uh, uh, I noticed that when I go to a hotel, I wonder whether there's a black person here last, or I mean, go down, you go down a list, right? Sure. So the point is, is that uh, we are all subject to racially problematic thoughts. One could call it white superiority thinking. That includes me, right? We're all subject to white superiority thinking, but because we have positioned racism to be such a, like a, a, a social, a social faux pas of the capital crime order. Uh, as opposed to what it needs to be, which is more like a second degree misdemeanor, which I think is because it's a capital crime, we can't admit it. And so but we can't admit it to ourselves or admit it to other people, but that, but that is the precise opposite of what needs to happen if we're gonna move forward. Because like I said before, it, it's, it, if we're going to get people who think racism is not real in society, we have to show them that it's real within us and we can be good people and still have these problematic thoughts. But so we're, if we're not willing to do that, you know, we, we're pointing at them and we're and asking them to change the narrative about society and they're not likely to do that as opposed to, like I said before, you know, hashtag we all have the virus. So I have it. Uh, it seems like other people have it. Do you have it? It's a whole different way. So I think that that changing your narrative about that is, is, is uh, vital. And, it, and, you know, it's important to upset the, the, the racist, non-racist binary, like you either rate not, uh, racist and bad or not racist is good and, and and instead that binary is not helping us instead we all have the problem it's just you know some of us are more asymptomatic than others okay well i'm going to get in touch with my racially problematic self right now and get into character as we embark on our our role play uh here all right uh, uh, online i want to 
walk through a, a, a conflict, a, a, we'll, we'll recreate a conversation that, that I've, you know, I've overheard quite a bit recently, uh, either face-to-face, -face, uh, online, uh, on, on the TV. And uh, so I will be that uh, person with racially problematic uh, thoughts and concerns, and you'll be our white ally. Uh, as we go we're both, uh, are we both going to be white people? We're, we're both going to be white folks. Okay. All That's right. right. Here so we go. Audience, see us as white people for now. That's right. <laughs> here, we, here we go. <laughs> you know, uh, David, I tell you, I am just fed up with all these protests, uh, the street violence, the graffiti, all the looting I see, all these thugs running out in the streets uh, all across the country. It makes me so mad. Uh, yeah, well, that's, I, I got you. Tell me about like when you see that, like tell, or, or yeah. hey, what happens for you? Like, tell me about that. You know, I, I feel like uh, it's just an excuse for a big uh, violent party and uh, they're just uh, milking this moment for all it's worth. And uh, I, I'm so afraid I, I can't even step outside. Mm, these you, get a, you get afraid. I mean, you, get, you get angry too? I get both. I get angry and I'm afraid, uh, you know, sometimes at the same time. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I know when I see, I know what you're talking about. I when I look at some of these some of these instances that happened, like I I saw a thing where these these people, like I think it was in Malibu, they were like rushing to surf store and stores and stealing like surfboards. And yeah. I've seen people, I've seen people at all sorts of high-end stores stealing stuff. And um, I know what you're saying, like like some some of this, and and then what I understand is that some of this is like by professional thieves, like professional pe people who come in and especially at the beginning of the protest, people do to, people are coming in and doing that. And then you got people who just like to cause chaos. So I hear you on that. Like, I, so so I, when I see that, it makes me it makes me frightened too. So I know what you're talking about. And and so what's interesting, I found, like I see a lot too, where you have these black folks whose, whose neighborhoods these things are in, who are trying to stop these white people from outside coming in and doing all that. And so my mind goes to those nonviolent protesters. So I hear you on those violent protests. Some of that violence is just, I don't understand it. But I'm wondering, how do you feel about those people who are the nonviolent protesters, who sometimes you see them uh, stopping the violent people, but other yeah. times they're just protesting. How do you feel about them? Yeah, I just, I don't get it. I don't feel like there's really, uh, I just don't see the need for the protests in general. I mean, there's, uh, I feel like, uh, you know, I think all lives, you know, should matter. I feel like blue lives matter. And I just don't, get it i just think it's inappropriate and uh it's just anti uh it's just anti-american so what that's interesting so to tell me about the experience of with uh with uh experience you had that makes you know that all this stuff about um protesting against the cops is not necessary it's just is uh, if you had a, a, an experience with cops that were were um that showed you that that stuff is crazy well i've i've always had really positive interactions uh with police personally um i've seen them do some really courageous things both on the news and and uh you know just just seeing uh brave things done on the streets and i i feel like uh um i'm just out of touch with what, what these protesters are demanding uh so right so you've seen like you like you've seen a positive some positive stuff with cops doing you said sure uh -huh. i have you remember any, uh, do you remember any one of those what comes to mind uh recently i i had a uh i saw a police officer um, it was actually a, a helpful uh, call out to uh, to let folks know that there was a disturbance at a local school, and uh, and made that known so that uh, parents could could follow up with them. Right, the lockdown but, situation. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, there are so many good cops out there. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what happened to uh, me um, a little while ago. So I was going over visiting this this friend of mine who's black, and on uh, the day I was visiting him. He was trying to do some uh, shooting on video. He put the he, he went around the block. He was in a rural area, uh, and he went around the block and he was like videoing on video, videotaping himself with his camera on the car. And I went to go get some coffee. And when I came back, um, the, uh, like a cop was had pulled up on my friend, and I, so I got there just as the uh, uh, the cop was rolling up, and the cop was basically talking to my friend about like somebody had called the police on him and and he had he it was weird he felt embarrassed like he he would embar he was embarrassed to have been called out and he was he didn't he didn't take my friends 
He didn't run his plates. He didn't take his license. He was like embarrassed. He's like, I'm sorry that I had to um, I had to come out here. But, you know, you got people calling the cops for no reason. He didn't he didn't call them racist, but he clearly felt bad about that. And I was like that. Now, that that is an example of good professional cop behavior. There so you go. I so I I really get that. So that's true. So when I think about all this, I also think about, so there's that, and I also think about other things. Like um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in uh, Minneapolis and I was walking around to get that, 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 that uh, those sky bridges. Yes. Past this guy who was a black guy. He looked like one of those like Somali or Eritrean people. We had that kind of look about him and he's a younger guy, he's much smaller than me. And we walked like this, uh, past each other. And then, uh, so I'm, I'm just getting my steps. I'm walking around almost randomly. And then I, turn and I'm walking and I, I took back I noticed this guy's behind me and so I was like oh, why is this guy behind me he's walking the other way so then I you know I, I'm just getting my steps on whatever I walk around I make a couple turns and then I notice like the guy's still behind me and then I like wait a minute what's this dude doing like what why, why is he behind me why is this dude this Somalia wait a minute those those people are kind of a lot of terrorists in Somalia like why is this young guy behind me he had an empty backpack too so um, I'm like wondering what is this dude doing? So then I made another turn and he's still behind me. And then I was like, oh my God, what's happening with this? Like I, <laughs> I went to a whole like crazy place. And so even though I'm way bigger than this dude, I like, I started doing evasive maneuvers. Like I, I pulled to the side and I like was checking my phone and this dude go by. And so the dude goes by and then it t- turns right on the same block. He turns into this like luggage store and he's clearly carrying his empty backpack to the luggage place. So, so what am, what am I doing, right? So I had turned him into some sort of terrorist, uh, into some Somali stalking terrorist. Like I basically criminalized this dude. Like I made him into some sort of a danger when he was just like a dude walking around. And so when I think about like, if I do that, if I, if I can turn some innocent guy into like a criminal, then you know, I'm doing the same thing mentally that those guys did to um, to Ahmaud Arbery, the guy like running around, right? The, 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 the Michael brothers in Georgia, or that sometimes cops do. They, 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 they have a whole image of people that is way re- unrelated to what they do, um, what, what, the, what they merit, because it's just suspicions. I mean, I, I criminalize this guy. So part of what I think about is, well, if I'm doing that, and other people like me are doing that, are good people doing that, then maybe this, maybe these people will come uh, protesting. Maybe there's something really happening that I just don't see as a white person. So, you know, we could talk about whether that's ever happened to you, but I'm just saying that is that uh, that's why I have some sympathy for those protests because I know racism is a real thing. Because I, I just, as an example, I just showed you. Mm. And for me, that's a great example of how the most important element of this race method that you outlined at the very beginning was you need to share a heartfelt experience that is revealing and yet truthful and true of yourself. Clearly in my example of the police officer doing something, I was making up on the fly and it didn't register at all. But the contrast is perfect. It's very potent, it's very powerful coming from you and it's very believable. Um, it, it, it almost forces somebody to give something a second look. Well, and, and just to be clear for the audience, so now now we're no longer white people. Yeah, we're, we're out of character now, we're back. <laughs> no white people. So, so just to be clear, that thing I talked about with the with the cop rolling up, that was like I, that actually happened. That was actually me filming. Like that actually really happened, right? And the thing with the turning the Somali the terrorist talking, the terrorist Somali terrorist talking to me, that was actually me too. Like 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 that was me walking around. So I did that. So that's yeah. why I remember I said earlier, a uh, hashtag we all have the virus. Me too, right? So sure. so those are both true stories. And so part of what we teach in the um, in the co- in the courses, in the books, and in the uh, the video courses and then the online uh, co- courses, uh, I hope we can talk about those a little bit before we close, is to like, you wanna get your stories together, right? You wanna, you wanna prepare for these conversations. Now, it's, it's, you can uh, prepare for on different topics, but what's most important is you just like get some, a couple general purpose stories, like a connect story and an expand story. An expand story, the best kind are the stories of like, like I just had, a story of your own racially problematic thought. And um, people have told us that it's transformative. If, like if they, if, first of all, having a plan is itself different because people get really flustered when people make racially problematic comments. They think their whole, <laughs> their whole, um, uh, the goodness of their soul is on the line when they step up to it or not. And so part of what we try to do is to give them some tools to like handle that moment. And that includes just having a couple stories that have a general purpose application and then maybe practicing with other people 
in role plays like we just did so you know how to use them and then over the course of time you can you grow your story bank but you're already you're ready to address it one of those quick pointers that jumped out at me was uh, you're at a dinner a contentious conversation is beginning to erupt over the subject of race you want to participate you reflect by saying i'll be right back just going to go uh, visit the bathroom for a minute just that 60 seconds two minute period to think and get your breath together and then come back uh was i think it was a great a great point no it's no that's what we you know when we when we teach the method or we teach the race method over a period of weeks like you know we have a we have a, a cohort starting tomorrow night um and so we'll teach it over six, four courses over six weeks for sessions, but the real work is in between, right? That the, the real work is the homework, right? And so for one of the first things to do is to figure out what is the listening tip and the relaxation methods you need, because we offer like five or six relaxation methods that people have learned to do in five minutes, but some people have gotten down to like, I can do this in a two minutes. Like you can do it on extended bathroom trip. So you can, you gotta relax and you gotta say, well, how, how can I, what do I need to do to remember to listen? I gave you an example earlier. But yeah, you can remove yourself. People feel like I gotta respond right now. When ultimately, if they calm down, if they remove themselves for a second, go get go get that drink and come back, they might be more effective. So, so and on some level, what this is about giving compassion and grace to yourself, right? You're not your whole being isn't on the line if you don't respond right then, right now. It, we do want people to respond. That's true, and we we even have a tool which anybody can go, anybody can take is a free tool. It's called the White Ally Quiz. If you go to whiteallytoolkit.com and take the White Ally Quiz, anybody can, it's a two question quiz and it gives you, we have six, your answers put you in one of six topologies and you can see what's your response pattern to that. So, mm -hmm. um, and our goal is to try to say every, ain't nobody doing this well, man. Every, every, a whole bunch of people messing up. It's just a question of how are you messing up? Are you messing up because <laughs> you are you messing up because like you get all agitated and you rush in with no plan and then you know cause disruption? Or are you messing up because all you do is like you hear it, you feel strong inside, and then go talk to the steering wheel on the on the way home, right? <laughs> neither, neither of those are effective. And so part of what we're trying to do is establish an atmosphere that ain't nobody doing this well. And so let us look at how we're not doing it well and then strive towards staying calm but still engaging because that that's that's what we want people to do yeah the inclusive nature of this is great i think a lot of our listeners are responding we've gotten questions online leading up to this event and we're getting them in uh in messages as we go along so i want to i want to get to some of those and then obviously recap with uh, your website and how people can get in touch with you and connect afterwards sure. but um let me start with this one this is david's selfish question because uh, David, as I've been out interviewing folks, uh, primarily in the triad area, I've heard from activists, politicians, historians, when it comes to grappling with the issue of, of racial injustice, uh, they're saying a lot of them, we're, we're living in a potentially once in a generation uh, time or more kind of time. But, but what, is, is that overblown or what's, what's your sense as you speak to folks across the country through your work, where we are now in relation to these sorts of conversations and and the racial uh, justice movement as it is. I think that um, things have come to a boil, and that's good. I mean, I I, I heard some estimate that twenty six million people have been involved in these protests. So uh, clearly, this is a special and unique time. So, uh, I think that it is it is a time to try to push something over a Rubicon, or I don't know what the right metaphor is, to push something to a new place. But I think that, um, so clearly that's true. But, and part of the reason that I, what I don't want to happen is for people to um, use the same tools that we have used in the past that have not been effective. So we, so the tool of protest has been helpful, but I think the tools of persuasion are so critical. The fact of the matter is, is that white people are incredibly divided on this question. They're, they're, and, and so if we're going to move forward, like, we, 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 you know, we need, when we get back to non-social distancing, we need to have racial dialogue. So we need, we're underinvested in that as a society. When we, so I hope that philanthropy starts investing money in having people talk. And we, we can start doing it online now, talk across the divide. But the, on some level, the real divide, the, the, uh, arguably the better divide to focus on is white people to white people, because white people are split on the question of uh, questions like, like I said before, is racism against white people just as significant as racism against people of color? They're split on the question of 
um, is are our current arrangements affected by slavery a lot or not very much? Or is the problem around discrimination that we we pay too much attention to it or don't pay enough attention to it? White people are split on that. And so part of the, the what we need to do is to figure out how to get the people who think that racism is a problem, racism, uh, interpersonal racism, unconscious bias is a problem, that they, that how many, to get the people who think that the racism of the past affects our current arrangements. And then the third corollary that those, that there are moral implications if either of those are true, to talk to people who say, to, the, to say basically, no, that no, it doesn't matter. You can't be unconsciously racist. The racism of the past doesn't matter. And, uh, uh, and it doesn't affect things and there's no moral obligation. Those people need to talk. And so what my project is about is getting the people on the side I agree with to use compassion-based best practices to talk to people on the other side, because it, we are lucky to live in a universe where compassion is actually a best practice. Like it, the universe didn't have to be like that, but it's like that. So, so ultimately what I try to tell people is that using compassion as you try to have these conversations, it's not just better for, um, for society, it's also better for you. Like it's, it's better for you spiritually to do that. And, and but, but there's another thing too, it's better for the country because let's remember that the, the, the we're being set apart by Mr. Putin. He has a whole set of people trying to help us, trying to encourage us to dislike each other. And so we need more compassion across the divide in general. And after this election, we certainly gonna need it. No matter what happens in this election, it's gonna be a whole bunch of people who are really bad. And so we, it is, it is vital that we start infusing our society with more compassion-based uh, skills so that after the election, we're not, we're not going to fall apart. This is a really divisive time. We need to make it less divisive, and compassion is key for that. And so that's why all my, uh, all my work is based around compassion, but also because it works better. <laughs> and I think uh, our first, I'm going to go to listener questions here now. Uh, these are folks who submitted at WFDD.org earlier in the week. And this one is a very compassionate uh, question, I thought. Uh, uh, so, David, what is the best way to show support to Black friends during this time? Is showing up to protests important, or would that be seen as white people trying to shift focus away from their experience, their time to speak? Um, so I would say well, there's really two questions in that. So yeah. in, in terms of supporting your friends, I think uh, what's important is to like basically ask, you know, what's the support that would, how can I be helpful to this, right? How, what support do you need, right? So it's not, a, so it's not about the, the, and what support do you need is even different than how can I be helpful? So uh, because the, the focus is on what they need. Some people might want you to talk to them about it. Some people want, might you want to use your friendship as the time to not be talking about this, right? So, and even in, in the in the Daily Show thing, part of the joke was part of one of the one of the biggest jokes in that little sketch was <laughs> the, the white woman is like coming to her black friend. This is crying. I can't believe it's so sad, right? And, and they're like, "What are you? You need to have that moment by yourself, right?" So, what you don't want to do is to is to make certain presumptions about what people need. So you want, so this is your friends, you want to ask what they need, how you can be, what, what does it mean to, to, um, for you to give support to them, whether it's backing off or coming close and talking about it. But in terms of the movement, I think that what people need to do is to decide, um, there's different ways of being supportive. Obviously, the, the most of these protesters, if you look around the country, have been white, right? That's been, that's, that is the magic of this moment, right? That, that white, so many white folks are involved in this. So I think, but once there, you need to listen to the organizers there, the people who seem to have some discipline and some sense of what they want. So there've been, there've been times in which white people get in front of the, uh, of, of the line so that it's harder for the police to just like go ballistic. And there've been times in which the organizers want the white people not in front. So it's important to listen to what the organizers want. Now, whether you go out and protest or not, I mean, I, I, I'm all the time with, people who like they're afraid to protest you know some of the, sometimes my project there's, there's a fair amount of older people in my project and you know I, and i'm older myself just to be clear but i'm just saying uh there are a fair amount of people like i'm not going out there to protest because of covid i said no problem the 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 the, the, the um, special thing about our project one of them is is that you don't have to go out and you, you can make a difference you don't have to go out and protest you don't have to get money i mean and those are all important to do but you don't, you don't have to read a lot of books. You can start tomorrow. Like if you if you want to make a difference on racism, if you think that the white public opinion on racism needs to be shifted, 
you can start tomorrow on the people that you know. So the, so I'm not against protests, I'm for protests, but I'm just saying that there's no universal answer. If you wanna go protest, go protest. But here's what I would say, systematically, white folks who are allies are under investing time and energy in talking to people they know. So, so I would suggest that people start, no matter whether they're protesting or not, you need to look at the people in your circle who have racy problematic attitudes as opportunities for you to both do some spiritual growth as well as do some work for the movement. So you can go protest, but don't ignore Skyler. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Skyler, edit again. All right, and we're getting a lot of questions online now, David, too. I'm gonna to go to yet another David. I won't read last names. I don't know if I have permission or not, but David writes, the biggest challenge I have is dealing with general ignorance. It is so exasperating for me to have to first overcome that before I feel I can have an authentic and meaningful conversation. Uh, I'm sure he speaks to lots of folks in that, that regard, but uh, what well, do you say to that? First of all, David is awesome by the very name he had. Yeah, it's a great name. But you got it wrong, bruh. Here's the deal. People are not, so I sound like Ross Perot. Here's the deal. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So here's the, here's the deal, which is you're not going to persuade people with facts anyway. Facts do not persuade people. There's something called the backfire effect, which basically is about the fact that when you try to persuade people with facts and try to move them from their deeply held, uh, deeply held beliefs, you almost all the time, you just re-entrench them in their beliefs. You can look at the backfire effect on the Wikipedia page so you know it's real. You can look it up, right? <laughs> so the point is, the reason that... Um, I, we, I said that you want to move people, to, you want to ask questions and give people experience because facts don't work. So basically, just to be clear, the two principles behind the race method are, I already said, agreement before challenges. And the first one is you want to have the conversation on the grounds of stories and, uh, stories and experiences instead of facts and beliefs. So, um, so while I love your passion, David, um, your whole strategy, which is around like educating people enough, is not is not likely to work anyway. So I would advise you to shift your strategy from one that's based on trying to educate people to one that tries to have rapport with people about your actual experiences. You're going to be much more likely to be successful like that. Hmm. Someone's uh, responded to our little skit. Phew, this is from Dove. This gets me agitated. Hearing this, even knowing it's role play, I feel building resilience is a must for allies. Well, look, I mean, that might be true, but let's, okay, the other one, another way of looking at it. Black folks have had to deal with problematic white people's attitudes for, I don't know, 400 years. And so one of the things that we learned is that like, um, you just don't have, uh, uh, how can I say this properly? White people, white people have been trained to believe that like they can just have their responses and it's just like, that's just how it is. And black people have had to learn that there is a, there can be a gap between what you feel and what you do. And so part of what we are suggesting that allies need to learn is this wisdom that like my great grandmama knew it because she had to deal with all sorts of problematic white folk and Zen masters know it which is that the, like, there is a difference between what you feel and what you do. So it is true that um, part of the wisdom we're trying to bring is that if somebody says something racially problematic, you might want to get mad and you can notice you get mad, but that doesn't mean you need to respond in an angry way because it turns out you responding in an angry way actually undermines your goal. If your goal is to not just be self-expressive self or if your goal is not just to tell yourself, well, I told them off, but if your goal is really move them, you need to get a hold of that. And so th that's part of the wisdom that is offered. And you could argue that the reason people know this is because, or black people know this, you go back to Du Bois with the whole like double consciousness. I got to look at who I am and how other people view me. You could look at it like that. But, and and you, so you're related to um, double, Du Bois or uh, Zen enlightenment, but the point is, is that there can be a gap between what you feel and what you do. Spiritual masters will tell you that. And so you're working with people who are racially problematic is a chance for you to do some spiritual growth. But if, if, if you can, we can go back to feeling guilty. You want to make a difference on racism, then work on the people in your circle. The good news is you will grow from doing it as well as make society better. 
It looks like some of the listeners are already ready to, to, to dive into the fray, uh, David. This, this listener writes, uh, do you have any good fallback questions for the A, for the ask questions portion of the race method? Well, the, 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 the fallback strategy, just to be clear, the, you're not trying to trap the person. What you're trying to do in the ask phase is to find, get them to talk about experience related to their belief. So if they, as an example, uh, survey data tells us that uh, 25, that no, it's 32% of white folks think that black people are uh, in, less industrious, i.e. they're lazy. Now, as bad as that is, that was in 2016. In 1990, it was 60%. So thank you, white people, for moving forward, right? So, um, but I'm saying if you if you run across that attitude, and again, a third of the white people have that, then, then the question is, I mean, you can try to fight them, but if you want to really move them, then you might say, well, tell me an experience that you had related to that, right? And they might talk to you about uh, some media outlet that was talking about that. And you say, well, it's great that you consume media, but you know, you can't always trust media. So I'm really interested in knowing what is your personal experience that tells you that's true. So the point is, it's not, you're not trying to ask questions to trick them. You're trying to ask questions so that they authentically tell you what is an experience related to their belief. Now, on occasion, they will just, they will discover from your asking the question that they've been propagandized. That uh, You can't bank on that though. What usually happens is they'll tell you some experience. You will not like the connections they're making between their experience and their conclusion. But the reason you calm yourself down in the, in the first step is so you can take that in and try to listen with an empathetic, open heart, even if you know, even if you have already assessed that their conclusions are spurious, but you're trying to, it's their experience. You cannot, it's hard to refute their experience, which is why you're trying to have an experience-based conversation in the first place. Because once you get to your story about racism, it's hard to refute your experience. You can, you can refute somebody's perspective or some opinion, but it is hard to refute their experience, which is why you want to have an experience-based conversation and be ready to come at that with an experience that demonstrates to you that racism is real. That's why, that's why you're doing that. Now, I'm, I, but to be clear, I think this method is a best practice, but it doesn't work all the time. No, but it works. It, it's effective. It's much more effective than the, than the argumentative method. I love our uh, WFUD listeners uh, because they're always, uh, well, for first off, they listen and they ask intelligent questions. And, and this one uh, was an area of this dialogue that we didn't really dive into, which is she's asking, Pamela asks, any suggestions for engaging someone who appears or sounds simply uninterested in different perspectives. Uh, well, I mean, so that, so that's a great that's a great question because one of the things I haven't said in this conversation is that I recognize that the task that this project is asking white folks to do is is hard because there's a prevailing understanding among white people that you're not supposed to talk about races. You know, it's unpolite. Not supposed to do it. Must less have conflict about it, right? So, and that you want to hide people. <laughs> There's a, we're not going to talk about the bad part, right? We're not going to talk about it at all. And so you're not going to have a disagreement, disagreeing conversation about it. So there's no question that what we're asking you to do is to do two things. We're asking you to <laughs> um, seduce people into a conversation that they don't want to have and to try to move their views. That's a, that's a hard task. So, you know, I, I recognize that. That is the challenge. Remember, the heart of racism is denial. So if we're gonna do this anti-racism work, then what we're, trying to, what we're talking about is how do we muster up our best skills to try to um, invite people to that conversation in ways that if, they knew, if, if, uh, if, you, if you did it explicitly, they wouldn't want to do it, right? But you're trying to, that, that is why it takes some uh, skill and savvy. So let me give you an ex example of that. So. And I know we got all the questions, I'll try to make this quick. So one of the things that is a common thing among uh, white people is something called racial anxiety. And that's like the feeling of uh, I'm uh, going to a cross racial situation and you were, were wonder whether you're negatively judged. Okay, you will you be negatively judged. Okay, got you, but judges are racist. So it, it can be useful to have a, a racial anxiety story in your head because suppose you're, you're dealing with somebody who has racial problematic views, you're dealing with your, you know, your cousin, Hannah, and you know she has views you don't like, and uh, you're you're you know you've decided that part of your ally work 
is to work on her over the course of this year. And I think that I think ultimately allies should always have a couple of people they're working on. That's part of being an ally should mean. So you know that. So then you are with Hannah and she has some inter- encounter with a um, person of color and she handles it. She, she's just fine. It's no, no big deal. So one of the things you could do is to say, you know, Hannah, I really want to compliment you for the way you, for that, how you did that, you know, the way you handle that. So you, ra- you raise it in a compliment. Right. And then you talk about like your and so, you know, because when you did that, I was reminded of this time I was interacting with a person of color and I was all nervous and I thought he might have noticed. So you're bringing up the topic through a compliment. Right. So you're raising the issue through a compliment. Now, will they go for that? Maybe, maybe not. But I'm just saying that's a that's a whole different thing than we need to have a talk about race. because I don't like your attitude. Right. You're 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 using strategy to bring them into a conversation, starting out with a compliment in order to raise the issue. Part of. Part of what we try to teach people is to figure out ways that work for them where they can be effective in bringing up the racial issue in ways that don't make other people feel nervous or defensive so y'all can have a talk about this issue that's so vital for this nation. Mm. Well, the, the questions have been rolling in and I, I, as much as I wanna get to each of them, believe it or not, we've just got about five minutes remaining and uh, I wanna- I told y'all this should have been 90 minutes. I told I y'all told that. You, make it 90 minutes uh, next time. We're not gonna have a hard out, so don't worry about that. Um, I do want to, and maybe we'll get a, a question or two at the, at the end, but I wanted to give talk a little bit about White LA Toolkit, your coursework, what this looks like kind of bring us in, for those who haven't been to your website and check these things out, how do they roll out? How do these interactions, these dialogues work out in a group setting? Uh, are they one-on-one? I'm curious to know how you've, and of course, how you've adapted with the online and blending sure. of events. Uh, okay, so here's one way to think about it is, we have engagement at different levels. So we have books. So we have the White Ally Toolkit, the White Ally Toolkit workbook. And all these books, you can buy them from Amazon if you want to give Jeff Bezos half the money. Um, or you can buy them on our website. You can buy them in PDF form. Uh, and obviously, that's better for the project. So we have the White Ally Toolkit Workbook, and we have uh, Equipping Anti-Racism Allies, and a couple and a couple other books that um, teach you these methods in the form of a book. So it's self-guided through a book, right? We also have the Race Method 101, which is like a video course. So if you have videos and plus worksheets, and it guides you through, like you you watch some videos, and then there's homework, and you can't get to the next phase until you do the till you log in in the homework it's on a learning platform right so that's the next level then the next level is a cohort so we have a cohort starting tomorrow night it's called doing my part to dismantle racism you can see all this stuff on whiteallytoolkit.com and i encourage people to do it and on that you're on a learning platform but you're doing it with other people right so so we have a cohort of people and we meet once every two weeks and i'm i, I and a couple of my assistant coaches are there and it's most mostly me. And then you 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 interact online with other people, uh, in, 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 interact in the Zoom meeting. But then in between, you're interacting uh, asynchronously. You're you're submitting your homework. Other people are commenting on your homework. The coaches are commenting. But and, and it's all about like you practicing different skills and then reflecting on uh, reflecting on the interaction, putting that in in, in 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 so we can all read it and give feedback. And then over the course of the of the course of the course over the uh, trajectory of the course people become more skillful at these compassion-based methods and you know people tell us it's very it's not only transformative on this but it also helps them with other things because the attitude you become people become more mindful and more compassionate generally because they're and it uh by practicing on this issue it has ramifications for the rest of their lives so that's the question so we, we try to uh, this project is about like changing the culture Right. I'm so grateful to be here. But th- this is why this is why I'm trying to get the word out as wide as possible, because, you know, all these anti-racism books are fantastic, but a lot of them are kind of like you thinking about yourself and, and, and that thing about yourself is important work to do. I think we need more energy on people like going out and then talking to other people because we're trying to change something that we all share. And I, and I just think that many more people can be an active agents of change. They don't have to, reading books is great, understanding themselves is great, but they can start working on working on this problem collectively right now. And so that's our approach to it. And I can say, I, one, of the, one of the positives that I draw from this is just how it, it lends itself to advanced listening. I, I've interviewed hundreds, of, you know, thousands of folks. There are lots of great talkers in the world, not so many listeners. And and if you can listen calmly in a conversation that's that can be this emotional, 
it, 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 the spillover effects are, you know, any other conversation is a piece of cake uh, in comparison. I mean, it's uh, the benefits seem to be pretty obvious. I would it's say. based, on, yes, it, 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 listening is vital. I mean, you know, my whole background is a, I'm a dialogue person. So essentially part of what this is about is me trying to pull together my 25 years of dialogue experience and try to put it in some nuggets that people can uh, learn and then use to have transformative conversations when there's no professional facilitator around. And that, that's, that's, that's what this thing is about. And on some level, this project is about trying to hack racism in that way. Like to say, what is the core, what are the core elements that need to be articulated and then spread to other people so that we can work on this 400 year problem and move forward? Fantastic. Well, David Camp is the author of the White Ally Toolkit. His most recent book is Compassion, Transform, Contempt, a Black Dialogue Expert's Advice for the White Progressives on down revving anger, creating connections, and maybe changing the world. And you can connect with David Camp at davidcamp.com or the whiteallytoolkit.com. Not the white, just whiteallytoolkit.com. Thank you so much, whiteallytoolkit.com. David Camp, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you. That was fun. And uh, as a reminder, WFDD's community conversations will continue next week, uh, August 6th, with reporter Carrie Brown and a group of expert panelists. The topic, what does back to school mean now? And you can register online at WFDD.org. I'm David Ford, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you.